Akhaban. Welcome to Libya. This, one of the most interesting desert countries, is gradually opening its doors to the outside world. It is a veritable treasure trove of history. Ancient art and culture of various epochs, as well as the fascinating exotic flair of the Orient, make Libya a wonderful and fascinating holiday destination. The capital, Tripoli, awakes early in the morning. Fishermen return from their nocturnal work at sea, along with their catch, fresh and tasty, and ready for the market. Soon there's much hustle and bustle. Huge fish are manually unloaded from tiny fishing boats. Here, the local marine life has not yet been destroyed by huge fleets of fishing boats. On the quay, the charm of the Orient is plain to see, as it is throughout the entire city, an exotic corner of North Africa. The old town is known as the Medina. With its narrow lanes and squat buildings, it's a combination of Arabian, North African and Mediterranean cultures. The joie de vivre of the local people is obvious, and music and dance are part of their daily lives. In antiquity, the city was called Ouya. It was one of the three cities of Tripolitania, and in Roman times, this section of the coast contained the trading towns of Leptis Magna and Sabrata. When this region was conquered in the 7th century by the Arabs, they made Oya their capital city and gave it total autonomy. Thus, Oya was the only one of the three ancient metropolises that remained inhabited and thus continued to prosper. Since 1963, Tripoli has been the capital of the great socialist Libyan Arab People's Republic of Chama Harisha, the state of the masses. Following age-old tradition, merchants and manufacturers of various products are located in the numerous alleys of the souk. Arts and crafts are still important here. Elsewhere, fruit and vegetables are available, and a wonderful array of fresh fruit is offered for sale each day, with marvellous spices adding to the exotic aromas. The triumphal arch of Marc Aurel is located at the exact centre of this ancient city, and the original man-made surface beneath the arch is still in good condition. The city and newly established region of Africa Nova fell to Rome. The Caramambi Palace has been lovingly restored and now contains a museum. This splendid building was built at the end of the 18th century. Once the former owner Yusuf Karamandi and his many wives walked through these shadowy arcades. Various well-furnished rooms take visitors back to bygone times and to the glorious atmosphere of a golden age. In the surrounding area, time has certainly not stood still. The traditional work of the city's tailors is now performed with hot irons and modern sewing machines. Today's Tripoli is undergoing constant development. Contemporary architecture is everywhere. Skyscrapers that contain offices and apartments have been built on the periphery of the city. The city's last remaining Orthodox church is dedicated to Holy George. He was a soldier of the Roman Empire who refused to persecute the Christians and so was put to death.
The interior of this Orthodox church is dominated by icons. Its windows to eternity are not painted, but written on. Unique works of art. The green square, a Shaha al Qadra, is situated in the center of the city. It's a place where both local people and tourists congregate. Large military parades also take place here. The former royal palace has at various times been occupied by Spanish, Turkish and Italian settlers until it finally became a museum with the aid of UNESCO. Tripoli has had a dramatic past and there's no better place in which to learn of this than the National Museum, the Yamaharia Museum. The artistic images of all epochs and those who once lived here are on display. Since its renovation, the museum has been one of the most modern museums on the African continent. The exhibits are divided into prehistoric, Byzantine, Roman and Islamic times. These great ancient treasures of bygone cultures add further to the mystique of this exotic desert state. Mosques are the prayer houses of Islam. One of the most beautiful is the Gurgi Mosque that was donated by a merchant, Yosef Gurgi, who originated from Georgia. The imposing Maidan al jazayya Mosque was once a Catholic church. Around the church is all the hustle and bustle of the old town. In Libya, belief in Allah and his prophet is part of daily life. And several times a day, the faithful come to pray. Almost the entire population is dedicated to the state religion, Sunnite Islam. Around 70 kilometers west of Tripoli, and also located on the Mediterranean coast, are the remains of the ancient trading town of Sabrata. Its theater has been rebuilt and is an impressive structure. It dates back to the second century AD and was built by the Romans who came here after the Phoenicians and gave the city a completely new appearance. It could accommodate up to 5,000. This amazing treasure lay hidden beneath the desert sand until it was discovered by a group of Italian archeologists. The old capital of the former Tripolitania experienced both its cultural and economic high season after it became part of the newly founded Roman province. Under Antonius Pius, Sabrata became a colonia, a title that gave the city a prominent place among other Roman cities. Several baths, including the sea baths that are situated close to the coast, indicate the luxurious living standards of those ancient times. Trade with the farmers of the surrounding area assured the inhabitants of Sabrata a comfortable lifestyle. Several of its citizens enjoyed much wealth. The city even had its own trading center in the harbor town of Antica Ostia that was part of Rome. But the decline of the Roman Empire brought with it the downfall of this city whose fate was closely linked with the Romans. The Arab rulers who followed subsequently chose Oya as their metropolis and the city fell into oblivion. The most important archaeological finds of the Tripolitanian metropolis are exhibited in the ancient city's two museums. With sculptures and mosaics that depict scenes taken from both ancient mythology and Christianity. At first, it was the Roman religion that dominated the city. 
But after some years, Christianity gained more and more followers. But the city's history dates back to before the Roman Empire. It was founded by the Phoenicians in the 7th and 8th centuries BC due to the convenient location of the harbour town at the junction of several traffic routes. Our journey to southern Libya begins. We leave the Mediterranean coast and venture inland. First we reach Ifrin, an old mountain settlement. Strategically located on the steep slopes of the Jabal Nafusa, old mud buildings nestle together to form a protective hole. The narrow alleys of this Berber settlement indicate harmony, with extended families, each one of which has a chief. Berber culture is strongly influenced by Islam, but also possesses a self-contained character known as free men. In addition to agriculture and livestock, the village community of Ifrin also produces pottery and numerous cave dwellings are open to the public. We follow the route along the Jebel Nafusa until we reach Ghazar al Hay, a fine example of an Arab storage castle. Around 800 years ago, a sheikh stopped here on his pilgrimage from Morocco to Mecca. While doing so, he gifted this large circular building. Its interior walls contain dozens of small chambers, side by side and on several levels, that are accessible via a narrow staircase small caves that were used for storage. The fortified buildings were well guarded and provided travelers as well as various nomadic tribes with storage rooms for their food and personal belongings. The generous sheikh also had a mosque and various dwellings built for travelers. Thus, this place soon became extremely popular. The castle is still used today for storage by a number of families, and so it's not surprising that this loam and stone building has been well maintained. When there was danger, the local people sought shelter here. Close by, and also built on the edge of rocks, is the old village of Nalut, that also provides a wonderful panoramic view. Old Nalut is no longer inhabited, but the remains of its mud buildings indicate how this former Berber settlement once looked. Its inhabitants were resettled in a nearby town, and their original village gradually fell into decay. Up here, the people felt secure as they had a good view of any approaching danger. The 
The buildings were constructed in the traditional way, the ceilings being supported by palm tree trunks cut in two. The properties can still be visited today. They give a good idea of the simple way of life of their former inhabitants. But the main attraction is the storage castle that has managed to survive the ravages of time. The storage rooms were built like honeycombs, one above the other. In the inner courtyard is another building that also has numerous storage rooms at different levels. The route to Haramas travels past the Sinan Oasis, whose palm gardens are no longer tended to, as the people who once lived here have since been resettled. In former times, oases were important resting places on the arduous journey across the desert. But modern roads make them less important today. The desert town of Kadamis is situated in the three-country triangle of Libya, Tunisia and Algeria. An historical oasis that lies within the Libyan desert. A seven kilometer long wall surrounds the town that has entered via seven gates. Each of the town's seven clans had its own entrance. Each of the clan's seven town districts was structurally similar. From the city gate, a roofed street led to the main square. Each district had its own mosque and Quran school. Each of the main streets led through the adjoining palm gardens that were encircled and separated by mud walls. It is said that 30,000 palm trees once grew here and were supplied with water by a spring in the oasis. For centuries, Kadamis has been the junction of several caravan routes. Thanks to the Mare Spring, this oasis town has benefited from a good supply of water. Indeed, it brought fame and prosperity. The houses were small but beautifully decorated. Several red framed mirrors assist in the illumination of the main room. the uppermost roof terraces, the women could survey everything, each approaching caravan or suspicious rider. The high season of this fascinating oasis town is long gone. No longer do caravans stop here on their way to Cairo, Tripoli and Timbuktu. Just like the country's former explorers, we venture further and further into the desert. We spend the night in Kirkiba camp, in circular straw huts at the foot of huge sand dunes. Next day, we visit Gama. About 2,000 years ago, this was the capital of the Garamantes realm. Today, it is only ruins. But the city wall has survived, built of pebble and rubble stone, and held together by unburned loam. English archaeologists discovered this ancient city in the 1960s. 
Excavation work was resumed in 1999 by the Libyan government. The Garamantes were the most feared opponents of the Romans. It is said that they had chariots and fought hard to retain their independence. Only the Arabs under their commander Okba ibn Nafi managed to defeat the Garamantes. They were enslaved without mercy. The remaining Berbers withdrew into remote and impenetrable terrain. They're thought to be the ancestors of the Tuareg of today. Then followed the rule of the Tubu, who were replaced by the Sultan of Morocco. Next, the Turks, and finally, the Italians. Gat is the only large oasis in the southwest of Libya. It was once an important caravan stop at the junction of several caravan routes. Even today, it's an important center for the Tuareg of this region. The old desert town is an accumulation of walls and alleys, roofs and terraces, toned in organic color. Today, the historic old town is uninhabited, but its stone walls and air-dried mud tiles still remain. A desert oasis town surrounded by huge sand dunes, not the most friendly of places, but it is the home of the Tuareg. The old town is somewhat small and its alleys fascinating. The town is overlooked by a fortress located on a natural rock beyond the town. The Kukuman fortress is more recent. Today, many attempt to stem the natural decay of the buildings and to save this mud town from further ruin. Gat is a precious legacy of our civilization and one that hopefully will continue to survive for many years to come. This is the entrance to an enchanting world of sand and stone. A Kakus is a fairy tale like natural area in the southwest of Libya, a place of silence and isolation. A little known world that is full of remarkable beauty. Such as the Guelta Tashunt, a wadi that is well known for a very narrow canyon that can only be entered on foot. Once, thousands of years ago, a highly developed society lived here, one that was more cultured than any other in the Sahara. The desert area of sand and rock is the result of various climate changes. There was once a savanna here. In 1850, a German geologist and archaeologist discovered prehistoric traces and the remains of an ancient culture in this area. Protected by huge rocks and hidden in a tangled labyrinth of canyons, rock paintings remained undiscovered for thousands of years.
At first, the Akakus region seems to be a hostile place. But despite the inhospitable terrain, people have settled here. Around 1,300 members of the Tuareg, a nomadic Berber tribe, inhabit this region. Mighty sand dunes rise into the sky. Sand deserts, such as this one in the Akakus, cover only 20% of the entire surface of the Sahara. The region contains many mysterious locations, such as a petrified forest that over time was the result of a process of silification, timber transformed into stone. The wind constantly creates new flowing patterns and lines on the large sand dunes, the infinite masterworks of nature. Yet the desert mountains of Akakus are far more than just a fascinating landscape. At first sight, it seems to be an insignificant dried out river valley. But the Wadi Madkandush hides a unique treasure of human history. A treasure that has lain hidden for thousands of years. Italian archaeologist and paleontologist Fabrizio Mori discovered many fascinating carvings in the rocks of Marcandus. According to the rock pictures, this region has not always been as dry as it is today. Thousands of years ago, the landscape was that of a savanna. Why the early inhabitants of the desert mountains of Akakus carved images of the indigenous wildlife into so many rock walls of the river valley remains a mystery. Perhaps the rock walls of this dried out river valley were once a sacred place. That would explain the excellent condition of the images. The Sahara. Located in North Africa, it's the biggest dry desert on Earth and measures around 9 million square kilometers. The Sahara extends from Africa's Atlantic coast in the west to as far as the Red Sea in the east. It is a tropical desert. The Saharan climate is extremely dry with hardly any rainfall and in summer the temperature soars to an amazing 55 degrees Celsius. However, the temperature here can be subject to much change with extreme fluctuation depending upon the time of day. At night, it can go down to minus 10 degrees. Most people think of the Sahara Desert as consisting mainly of sand. This is not true as it's stone and rock that cover most of its surface. Its landscape features great plateau of sandstone, volcanic sediment and five mountain ranges that rise to 3,000 meters above sea level. Three quarters of the Sahara is without vegetation and due to the angle of the sun, it is the hottest region on Earth. Despite the harsh environment, a lively and lucrative trans-Saharan trade developed across the desert in around 1000 BC. At first, it was the Carthaginians. And three centuries later, trade reached a new high due to the Romans, who introduced the camel as a beast of burden. 
Without the camel, or to be more precise, the single humped dromedary, human habitation would have been impossible here. The Sahara is rightly called a wonder of nature. Nestling among the huge sand dunes of the Libyan Sahara is one of the most striking natural wonders on earth, the Mandara Lakes. The appearance of the lakes varies according to prevailing groundwater conditions. For those who live in the deserts of the Tuareg, it's a common sight. Some of the 11 lakes have dried out, while others are at their most impressive. Between the Wadi Ajal in the south and the Wadi Ashiati in the north is the tongue of the seemingly endless ocean of sand of the Ubari. Each lake is surrounded by a green belt in which reed and date palms create what is tantamount to being a biblical ambience, a magnificent oasis. Some of the Mandara lakes dry out completely, but are not buried by the ever-moving masses of desert sand. It's a fascinating miracle of nature. People settled around the lakes, the worm eaters. The most famous is also the largest of the Mandara lakes, Gabaroon, in the south of which is an 80 meter high sand dune. The lake is situated in a peach-coloured, 200-metre-high dune area, framed by reeds and palm trees, a typical oasis. Today, the Mandara Lakes are a popular tourist attraction, an almost extraterrestrial-looking scene of paradise, one of the last paradises on Earth set amid the Sahara. The short journey takes us to Sabia, the metropolis of the south, a lively administrative city that originated from seven individual oases. Images of Colonel Gaddafi are omnipresent. He was the leader of the Green Revolution in 1969 that forced the king to resign. Here, the city dwellers like to relax. Here are club-like holiday resorts with Libya's typical bungalows, various entertainments and a small animal park. An amazing sight for the middle of a desert. From the Sahara, we travel to the country's eastern Mediterranean coast and to ancient Chirinaika, the largest city in today's Benghazi. Of the historic city of the Pentopolis, the Greek Five City Alliance, nothing remains today as it is now covered by modern city buildings. The former Italian cathedral decorates the promenade of the harbour city. Some distance away, huge cargo ships lie at anchor and harbour work goes on both day and night. Since Libya's independence and the discovery of oil in the south, this region has developed out of all proportion. Further east are the ruins of the ancient coastal city of Ptolemais, 
This town was also once a member of the Pentapolis Alliance. The original Greek Ptolemaic architecture was gradually substituted by Roman Byzantine buildings. A fact that makes the work of archaeologists somewhat difficult. A devastating earthquake caused great damage here and the city fell into ruins along with all of its splendid works of art. The debris of the buildings are scattered across the plains and indicate the former size as well as the geometrical structure of the former city. When the last Ptolemaic king, Apion, died in 96 BC, Kirinaika was taken over by the Romans. They flanked its long colonnades with palatial buildings that were financed by rich merchants. The former great Palace of Pillars appears with a fine view of the sea. Some of the region's super rich were former pirates who plundered the coastal waters of Kirinaika. Rome hunted them down. But Cornelius Lentulus Marcellinus did not enslave them and instead settled them here and let them live as prosperous citizens. Further east, we visit Kazia, Libya, that is situated on a mountain ridge, a small fortress that was also in use before the Byzantine epoch. During the rule of the Vandals, this place was unimportant, but under Roman Emperor Justinian, it became very influential. A basilica with a foundation in the shape of a cross originated in the 5th century. Fifty well-preserved mosaic plates are on display in their own museum. They were discovered and excavated in 1957 in the small East Church that is located 100 meters from the museum. They originally formed the floor of the church. Close by is Albaida, 614 meters above sea level on the slopes of the Jebel Akhtar and with traditional white buildings. The White One is a modern city that in 1964, during the rule of King Idris I, became the administrative capital of Libya. In 1843, Muhammad Arias Sanusi founded a Muslim Brotherhood here that was named after him. This brought him the distrust of the traditional dignitaries who banished him from the city. But his doctrine spread to the entire Sahel zone. Some kilometers away is Serena, the Athens of Africa. An ancient city on the slopes of the green mountain of Kirinaika a coastal region in eastern Libya. On the slopes beneath the lower city is a necropolis that contains many thousands of graves. It has been here for several centuries.
The Oracle of Delphi once advised the inhabitants of Greece's volcanic island of Santorini to move to the North African coast where they would find a golden land. Within the rock walls of the canyons, on the same level as the lower city, are a number of well-preserved caves in which the Greeks had their baths. The settlement consists of an upper and a lower city. The lower city is the oldest. It was here where Greek emigrants settled. The Pentapolis was established here, the alliance of five cities, and the Cyrenaica became the granary of Greece. Cyrena grew rapidly and also prospered so the harbour of Apollonia originated, as well as some regional towns. Then followed the Egyptian Ptolemaea, who made this town a centre of learning. In 96 BC, the last sovereign handed Cyrenaica over to the Romans who, as was their custom, introduced their own culture. The Roman Empire also influenced this region. However, in the 4th century, the decline of Rome had begun and invasion by nomads endangered both agriculture and trade. Alas, this marked the beginning of a long degeneration of Cyrenaica. Cyrena had its own harbour, Apollonia, around 20 kilometres away with a fine coastal location. It was a natural harbour. As was usual at this time, the harbour city was thought to be protected by the god Apollo and was also named after him. It even boasted a theatre. Mighty city walls protected the city and its inhabitants. The buildings had their own water supply. The ruins of three churches that date back to Byzantine times show nothing more than a few splendid marble pillars. The remains of a Byzantine palace that was once the seat of the local governor indicate the former wealth of the city. During the high season, trade was carried out to as far as England, thus grain from North Africa was traded with tin from Cornwall. The Roman Empire dominated the city, but the ruins that can be seen today are mainly Byzantine. With the downfall of Serena, the harbour city of Apollonia fell into oblivion. Today, the main part of the harbour lies underwater. Finally, we reach the eastern part of the country, two ancient places with beautiful Byzantine church ruins that are located on the Gulf of Bomba. In Latrun, the ancient Erythron, are the remains of two churches. One is the West Church that is surrounded by a wall. On the floor of its interior are plates and sections of light marble that are decorated with crosses, blossom and leaves. They were placed here by archaeologists. Many of the once 50 churches of the area were built on the steep rocky coast. There are also entrances to numerous rock graves.
The view from the coast inland features the nearby green mountains, the Golden Land. Of the two churches, the elevated one to the east has only managed to retain its foundation walls. A sad sight for what must have once been a splendid building. Also, Latrun was one of the cities of the Pentapolis, and at the end of the 4th century, the seat of the Patriarch, and an important place of pilgrimage. In 1960, American archaeologist Walter Widrick discovered the two churches and excavation began some four years later. The foundation walls of the Byzantine Basilica in the nearby Rash al-Hilal are in good condition. Its dimensions are huge. The elevated church ruins provide a wonderful view of the sea, a spiritual place indeed. Steps to various galleries in ruins, rooms for water systems, and the remains of once huge mosaics. Sections of coloured marble were assembled to form impressive mosaics using the opus sectile technique. They once adorned this splendid house of God. The Byzantine doctrine, the Orthodox Church of the East Roman realm, is in both language and thinking influenced by Greek culture right up to the present day. Our final journey takes us to one of the most impressive ruins of antiquity, the legendary city of Leptis Magna. A unique ancient metropolis, a fine treasure trove on Libya's Mediterranean coast. The third city of Tripolitania has an extraordinary history. Phoenicians, Carthaginians and Numidians once ruled over this place until the Romans arrived. However, its forced integration into the Roman Empire did not bring economic stagnation, but instead a splendid epoch of prosperity. The former Leptis became the Great Leptis. This was the birthplace of a Roman emperor, Septimius Severus. Septimius favored his hometown and permitted it to be free of tax, so its inhabitants gained immense wealth. After Rome and Carthage, Leptis Magna was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, as is evident by these impressive excavation sites. However, following the city's high season came its sad decline, a decline caused by the hostilities of local tribes and the Vandals, as well as a number of devastating earthquakes. The once magnificent Leptis Magna was subsequently abandoned. Only the many impressive remains of its once glorious buildings, such as the magnificent theatre, indicate the former greatness and power of the ancient city.
Following the conquest of Tripolitania by the Arabs in the middle of the 7th century AD, the center of power was transferred to Oia, today's Tripoli. Yet Leptis Magna is one of the most important and striking archaeological sites of antiquity. Tripoli, along with the historic towns of the former Tripolitania, is one of the most spectacular places of ancient culture in North Africa. The heritage of an advanced civilization located on the edge of the Sahara. Magnificent history, untouched coastlines and endless desert landscapes with oasis settlements, salt lakes, rock paintings and Berber towns. Libya, a little-known land in amazing North Africa.